the notes. I don't know if you want to go through it all. Really all day. Okay, I can confirm that we're now live. Thank you. All uh, right. Good morning uh, to members, to officers and to uh, members of the public who've uh, given up their mornings to watch this cabinet meeting of South Cambridgeshire District Council. Uh, my name is Bridget Smith and I'm the leader of South Cambridgeshire District Council and I'm the chair of the cabinet. And for information of members of the public, the cabinet is made up of myself and eight lead cabinet members and we're responsible for most council services for preparing the budget and for the council's major policies and strategies which go on to be considered by full council. So uh, could all um, cabinet members please keep their cameras on and could, uh, but keep your microphones muted unless you're actually speaking and if you'd like to speak could you notify us in the chat um, but the chat is just for notifying that you uh, you wish to speak, please. Uh, so normal procedure at Cabinet is that votes are taken by affirmation um, and we'll continue to do that. But when we move to a vote on any item, I'll ask if members agree with a proposal and if any member wants to either vote against a proposal or to abstain, then we'll actually take a roll call of all the members. And I'll ask each Cabinet member to speak into their microphone so that the vote is clear to everybody, um, to, to the rest of the cabinet and to the members watching the web part, webcast. The members should respond for, against or abstain when their name is called. Uh, so I won't, um, I won't go through asking cabinet members to introduce themselves. Uh, their name should all appear on the screen. And I think it also says which, uh, which ward members represent as well. Uh, so as well as the cabinet, um, we have scrutiny uh, uh, here. So we have Councillor Grenville Chamberlain, who is the chair of the Scrutiny and Overview Committee present in the meeting. Um, and I think we have a number of non-cabinet members as well who may well choose, choose to speak. On top of that, we have um, our key officers, uh, Liz Watts, our chief executive, Stephen Kelly, director of Shared Planning Service, Jeff Membry, Head of Transformation, Rory McKenna, our monitoring officer, uh, plus various other support staff. So moving on, so we're, we're trying today to do a paperless meeting. Uh, so if it's a bit clunky, uh, please bear, bear with us. I have screens all over the place and split screens and uh, it's all a bit complicated, but uh, we're trying very hard to uh, move to be a paperless council. And uh, this is members demonstrating that we can do our bit as well as our officers doing doing their bit on that. So the um, starting on the agenda um, as leader, I've got no announcements this time round. Uh, so we're going to move on to apologies for absence. So Jonathan, as our um, responsible democratic services officer, are there any apologies for absence, please? Thank you, leader. Uh, we've received one apologies for absence from Councillor Judith Ripper. Thank you. And Councillor Ripper is the um, vice chair of the Scrutiny and Overview Committee. Are there any other apologies anyone would like to notify us of? Nope. OK, uh, so moving on to item three is declarations of interest. So do members have any interest to declare in relation to any item of business on the agenda? Um, and if an interest subsequently becomes apparent later in the meeting, could you just raise it at that point? Nope, so no declarations of interest. So moving on to the minutes of the previous meeting. This is where I find I'm my papers are at the very end instead of the very beginning. Um, so the minutes start at page page one. Um, and I will go through page by page. So page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, and finally on page seven. So um, righty ho. So do we all sorry, do we all accept that uh, those meetings are a correct record of the meet the last meeting? Agreed. 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 Okay, Agreed. does anybody want to vote against? Or abstain? I, I 
Leader, I will abstain since I wasn't present at the meeting. Thank you very much. So that was Counsel Councillor Neil Goff is going to abstain as he wasn't present at the meeting. So Cabinet therefore agrees the approval of the minutes as a correct record by affirmation. So moving on to item five, our public questions. And I believe that we have one public question ahead of this meeting from Mr. Daniel Fulton. And um, uh, have we got Mr. Daniel Fulton in the meeting? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm here. Hello, Mr. Fulton. Hello. Uh, so, so welcome. I hope you're keeping well in these difficult times. Uh, nice to see you. Would you like to um, place your question? Sure. Uh, the Fused Land Consortium is in the process of conducting an audit of the Council's PS2 planning performance returns submitted to the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government between Q3 2018 and Q3 2020. To date, our volunteers have completed the audit for Q2 2020. Although the Council reported to the Ministry that 85% of decisions on non-major applications were taken within the statutory determination period or within the period of a planning performance agreement or an extension of time meeting the requirements set before Parliament by the Secretary of State, the actual performance statistic was only 9%. Councillors have been provided with a document detailing our results on a decision by decision basis. In light of the serious nature of the irregularities discovered in the Q2 2020 return, will the portfolio holder for planning ask the Council's internal audit team to audit the PS2 planning performance returns for non-major applications uh, from Q3 2018 to Q3 uh, 2020. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Councillor Toomey Hawkins as the lead member for planning to answer your question, Mr Fulton. Uh, thank you, Leader. <clears throat> uh, Mr Fulton, thank you for your question. Uh, firstly, I wish to reiterate uh, that we do take our legal obligations extremely seriously and we do take care to report accurate data as we are required to do. Secondly, the submission from Fuse Lane Consortium has no supporting explanation as to how those figures uh, have been arrived at and the council does not agree with the performance figures arrived at by Fuse Lane Consortium and we remain of the view that the Q2 2020 submission is indeed correct. But while on that basis, I do not consider it necessary to undertake an audit of what will be thousands of decisions made since 2018, but given the continued time being spent by our officers on responding to this matter and the work of Fuse Lane Consortium volunteers and my desire to provide reassurance on this issue, I am happy to ask that the internal audit team review and report on the Council's Q2 2020 submission. This will, I hope, allay any wider concerns you might have on the matter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Hawkins. Uh, Mr Fulton, do you have a second request, a follow up question you'd like to ask? Uh, I don't, but I would just like to thank Councillor Hawkins for her very reasonable response. Um, and I look forward to seeing the uh, report in due course. Um, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much, Mr Fulton. All right. Uh, so we're moving on now to item six, and that's issues arising from the Scrutiny and Overview Committee. And I'd like to invite uh, Councillor Grenville Chamberlain to present this report. Uh, good morning all. Thank you, Leader. Uh, I'd really just like to focus on the update to policing matters. So you will be aware um, that we we had a very successful hour of time with the Chief Constable who attended our meeting uh, and he provided some extremely detailed answers to our questions. I think the thing that I would like to focus on is to encourage all members to um, please arrange that any members of the public who see something which they think is out of the ordinary and perhaps uh, incorrect, they ought to report it to the police, whereas so much of the police activity nowadays is focused around uh, intelligence. As a result of that intelligence, they've had a great deal of success 
in closing down a number of drug uh, producing plants, including one here in Hardwick, I'm horrified to say. Um, but the, and uh, the Chief Constable is keen that we should continue to do so and they will follow up and investigate as the um, intelligence is developed. Uh, other than that, the report I think is uh, stands as it is. It was an excellent meeting once again, um, but I'm happy to take any questions, Leader. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much indeed, Councillor Chamberlain, and uh, my thanks to uh, the members of your committee and uh, and for the lovely brevity of this report as well, which is uh, which is always. These matters, I'm very aware uh, in my neck of the woods of a very alarming rise in catalytic con converter thefts as well. So uh, next time you speak to the, ch the uh, police, it'd be interesting to know how they're targeting that, which does appear to be you know, seriously organised crime and um, and very aggressive, actually, quite very intimidating. Um, so do any cabinet members have any questions for Councillor Chamberlain? No. Uh, do any other members have any questions for Councillor Chamberlain? No, move on. So an ex excellent report. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Chamberlain. Thank you to your committee and the uh, members you're asked to note the report. Thank you, Leader. Thank you. Uh, so moving on now to the actions taken under the chief executive's delegated powers, um, which have been, you know, have been enhanced because of the uh, pandemic situation. And these pertain mainly to um, allocation of grants and monies coming from the uh, from the government. Uh, are there any questions from any members in relation to this report? No, any questions from anybody else? OK, so this report is similarly just for noting. Uh, so moving on to the item eight, uh, which is on page 15. It's a large report from 15 to 256. And this is the authority monitoring report for Greater Cambridge 2019 to 2020. Uh, Councillor Jimmy Hawkins is going to uh, move the move the recommendation and I believe uh, Councillor Aidan van der Weyer is going to be seconding it. So if I could uh, ask to pop Councillor Hawkins to uh, introduce this please. Uh, thank you Leader. Um, yes, as you've said, it's uh, it's quite a large report, um, but a lot of work has gone into it. So firstly, I would like to thank all our officers uh, for the massive work that has gone into preparing this report, um, especially during the period of lockdown that we've had and working from home with all its um, challenges. The annual monitoring report is a document that we are required by government to produce and um, I'm pleased to say we are as such have taken great care to ensure that we produce an accurate picture of the impact of our planning policies on the district and of the progress that we're making against our local development scheme. Uh, this report is produced jointly with Cambridge City and uh, covers the period from 1st April 2019 to 31st March 2020. And just to remind us that the adopted policies for this period are the, um, the local plans for both city and south camps adopted in 2018, and the four area action plans, which are the Cambridge East, Cambridge South Fringes, Northwest Cambridge and Nosto AAPs. Um, I don't want to take too much time, but just to highlight some key findings here. Um, we are making very good progress with uh, our Greater Cambridge Local Plan, which we are developing together with, uh, with the city. And you might recall we had a very uh, successful first conversation, um, issues and options consultation in January and February 2020. Uh, its reach was way beyond uh, what we've had in the past and the responses we received have been very helpful indeed in helping us towards preparing the joint local plan. And we are working well with uh, our Cambridge City partners, uh, glad to say, and with other uh, organisations that we're required to work with under the duty to cooperate, especially to address uh, cross boundary issues. Um, we didn't make new neighbourhood plans in period, but since then we now have some villages Binky. progressing well 
with the um, with their neighborhood plans and we continue to encourage uh, villages who want to to create uh, neighborhood plans. Um, in terms of the number of dwellings that we were able to uh, deliver in that period, we had 1,567 dwellings built, of which 1,107 were in South Cambridgeshire. And also 37% of all houses built in South Cambridge were affordable housing. And for those who are quite interested in renewable energy, I'm happy to say that we had 2.4169 megawatts of renewable energy installed uh, in Greater Cambridge, of which 2.4 of that was in South Cams. Um, the actual uh, tables that show the uh, housing delivery numbers in detail is in Appendix 2 on page uh, I'm not sure what page that is now, uh, 170 of the report. Um, and it's a series of charts which, um, you know, give the, 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 the full details. But, you know, I'm happy to take questions after which I would uh, recommend that we note the report um, as required on page 15 of, the, of our, our cabinet papers. Thank you. Leader. Thank, thank you very much, Councillor Hawkins. Uh, Councillor uh, Van der Weyer, do you want to speak on this at this point? Uh, no, I'll speak at the end if, if necessary. OK, right. Have we any questions from uh, Cabinet members? No, OK. Any, any questions from any other members who are present in the meeting? Uh, um, yeah. Councillor Anna, so I've got. Um, can you note? Can you put it in the chat, please, if you want to speak? I've got Councillor Anna Bradnam first. Thank you very much, Leader. Um, I uh, just wanted to ask, and it may be a matter of misunderstanding, um, but I just wanted to ask if I could have some clarity. Um, looking at um, it's page one hundred and well 180 182 of our agendas and probably um i can't actually see what number it is in the report because the numbers overwrite each other but it's about gypsy and traveler pictures so 182 in our agenda i just wanted some clarity about um whether it was i think i read in the report that we realized we had sufficient traveler pictures and that's why we didn't have any new ones um, since 2016. I just wondered if I could have some clarity there, some uh, um, explanation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hawkins, do you want to answer this or do you want to defer to an officer? Um, I think it, my recollection is that we had allocated some in the current local plan, so we do have enough as it stands, but we will be reviewing that um, obviously within the new uh, local plan work as we're going along. Okay, yes, it was, I mean, it was my understanding that we had sufficient allocation yeah. as right. things stand at the moment. Um, I don't, does, um, would, would Mr Kelly like to um, add anything to that? Uh, thank you, Leader. Uh, yes, just, 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 to, just to confirm that, at the local plan examination, the council's evidence that was submitted suggested that we had sufficient numbers of pitches for um, the need identified at that time. You'll be aware that the government's definition of gypsies and travellers actually changed during the plan period. Um, but we are uh, undertaking jointly with uh, neighbouring authorities a new needs assessment um, to help inform the new local plan, given that uh, the inspector at the time did uh, have some questions about, about the approach. So our policies at the moment are um, uh, to support effectively applications are, are subject to specific criteria rather than to include particular allocations in the adopted local plan. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. Um, OK, moving on, uh, Councillor Claire Daunton, we'd like to ask um, your question. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, yes, my question relates to 3.79 on pages 62 over on to 63 of um, the agenda papers. Um, and this is the section on listed buildings. Um, and I, I just wanted some reassurance that um, we are working on updating our guidance to owners of listed buildings on energy efficiency. Um, because I know that Historic England are working on that. So I just wondered, 
just wanted reassurance that we are up to speed and up to date on the latest energy technology that's suitable for listed buildings. Thank, thank you very much. Yes, an issue that's close to my heart as I that's sit right. as I sit wrapped in wool in my freezing cold listed building here. Um, so, Councillor Hawkins, do you want to take that, or do you want yes, to? Yes, please. Uh, I, I thank you, uh, Councillor Donton. I can definitely assure you that we are working on that. Um, I know that the uh, the Built and Natural Environment team currently have a project ongoing looking at um, updating advice to. Uh, owners of heritage buildings on what they can do to improve energy efficiency of their homes. Um, and once we have, once I have some more uh, information on how far we are with that, uh, I think probably you'll be the first to know because I know you are quite keen on that. Uh, can I can I be number two in the list, please? Uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Kelly, yes, do you want? Yes, <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Do you want to add anything to that? Um, not significantly, no. We are we are uh, very alive to the objective of trying to support owners with uh, in listed buildings and in conservation areas in appropriate alternative technologies. We're also working um, uh, to see how uh, colleagues in building control who have particular expertise in 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 obviously energy management in buildings might be able to assist in that. But uh, as Councillor Hawkins said, perhaps we can provide an update um, uh, to you on on timelines and and actions. Thank you. Lovely. So, so I am. I'm, I'm seriously very interested in this. Bearing in mind, in South Cambridgeshire, we have so many conservation areas mm. and so many listed buildings, and you know there is a sense that it's not a level playing field for those of us who have cold, leaky old buildings that we are looking. We are looking after, um, you know, for future generations. But, uh, but. Uh, facing very, very high fuel bills and very cold homes as a consequence. So it'd be really nice if we as a local authority could uh, be leading the way in this and doing some really innovative stuff that could be picked up with other er other areas as well. So that's very exciting work. Um, so sorry, Lydia, might I ask um, another yes. question? Um, OK, um, I'm really sorry. I marked this out and I can't find it now where I've marked it. Um, so I'll try to be as um, brief as possible. Somewhere in the report, um, it mentions whole life housing. Um, and uh, uh, also um, it mentions making sure that um, any extensions, etc., are fit uh, for purpose for the whole life of the resident as well as the whole life of the house. Um, and I just wondered, what effect latest legislation on permitted development had had on that? That's a really good question. Uh, Councillor Hawkins, do you want to? Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I can answer that question in the level of detail that um, uh, Councillor Donton might require. Perhaps uh, Mr Kelly might have a point or two. Uh, I'll see if I can offer some some comments. Certainly the government's recent changes to permitted development, which introduced a prior approval requirement, have started to focus on minimum room standards, but clearly that's some way short of our objectives around lifetime homes. Um, in terms of the, obviously this report relates to your current adopted local plan uh, and its provisions, but as we go forwards with the new joint local plan, it, it's really important um, for officers and I know for members to see how far we can put a policy framework in place that will both help us with those prior approvals, but also, uh, which of course we only have limited control over, uh, but also how we can support and um, encourage uh, lifetime homes um, uh, in every in every house that we, we start to see uh, coming forward through the next plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. And of course, this is very critical now, particularly, you know, we, we've seen with COVID the importance of people having having homes which are you know, conducive to their health and well-being as well. And we need to be doing as a country, we need to be doing more to be able to keep people safely in their own homes, even in times of crisis. Um, so thank you very much indeed, thank Councillor you. Daunton. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Leader. And um, I just wanted to ask questions. Apologies, my page numbers because I'm being very brave and I've gone paper free on my council agendas, which sometimes means that the online documents don't quite tally up the paper ones. So I have A1.12 as my page reference on here, um, which is in the appendix one. Um, and it's just about the, the 
West Cambridge master plan and later on, I think A116 and some other places, um, master plans are in the amber. So I just wanted to say is, is that, you know, because of perhaps I know the COVID impact was earlier on, is there some explanation why we're not quite on target of our master plans and what sort of impact could that, if it if indeed it does have on the five year housing land supply, sort of how reliant are we on sites such as um, the West Cambridge? Thank you, Leader. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Williams. Um, Councillor Hawkins, do you want to go? Do you want to take that or do you want to go straight to uh, Mr Kelly? I think I will go straight to Mr Kelly yeah. on this one. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Leader. Uh, the um, the West Cambridge site is obviously uh, in Cambridge City Council's area, but um, the master plan that is uh, re being referred to, the uh, Cambridge University submitted an outline planning application, in fact, shortly after I arrived at the Council in 2016, uh, and that application has, has uh, taken some considerable time because of the transport issues associated uh, with it, but also in terms of some of the scale massing and studies that were done to support responses from local communities, but also concerns that officers had had about the layout. So that particular application um, is being revised, as the text says, uh, and clearly um, we can't, until we've uh, granted the outline application, we can't conclude the position on master planning, but that's why that site is um, uh, marked as amber. Um, the uh, site is in fact allocated and already benefits from an outline planning permission for very substantial additional um, floor space. Uh, so officers are not at this stage concerned about the implications for either economic growth or delivery against the plan. OK, so uh, there was a specific question about the five year housing land supply. So you're saying there's no there's no impact. The, the West Cambridge master plan has no residential development upon it and therefore has no. No, no residential development. That's super. Uh, so, uh, Councillor Williams, does that answer your question or do you want any other points of clarification? Um, I, I use that as one of the master plans that aren't placed as an example, but there are some others through the report. But I'm, um, so yes, yeah, so a bit more on stage that how that uh, affects the five year land supply potentially. But I'm happy to um, have an answer to that outside of this meeting if, if if required, Leader. Um, and uh, I was just going to say on the listed buildings, um, it's also we've seen a big impact on that with the solar together, which I know I've been helping residents with here um, and some of my family have uh, buildings in um, listed or conservation areas. Um, and I think it is really important that we get something sorted on that because that way um, we don't want them to be able to they're missing out on potentially schemes such as the solar together, which has been a really great initiative with them for the district council and the county together. So it'd be great if we could see something before that deadline. Thank you, Leader. OK, um, so OK, so I think uh, it might be helpful, actually, if you and I had a conversation about you know, what what problems you think people are facing who want to put an application to the solar together. I think if we take that offline um, so we can just get a bit more detail about that, if there's some specific issues. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Councillor Jeff Harvey. Yes, um, uh, thank you, Leader. Um, I want to refer back to um, Councillor Daughton's interest in uh, historic buildings and particularly how we can um, encourage better uh, fuel efficiency or energy efficiency in historic buildings um, and um, <clears throat> also um, very pleased to hear from um, Councillor Hawkins that sort of work is underway uh, on that front and I think probably as part of that work, I noticed that some of our uh, very helpful advice to residents has been updated uh, on the historic um, uh, uh, fabric part of our um, website. Um, but, and, and, and um, in fact, we did have the historic buildings um, experts with, with, within um, South Cams come to present their plans quite um, early on in um, uh, 2020 in January, I think. and. I think probably speaking also for uh, Councillor Pippa Halings, who chairs the Climate and Environment Committee, I think our our sort of um, hope was that um, obviously uh, what we can do in terms of allowing people to make their uh, listed buildings uh, more energy efficient is to some extent constrained by um, a sort of national policy. Um, mm. 
but as in all these things, I suppose there's some wriggle room. Um, and I think um, our hope was that we would be, in terms of um, how those uh, regulations are applied by officers on the ground, that there will be a sort of gradual cultural shift from a, a sort of permissive system to a, a proactive system, if you like, in terms of actually encouraging people to do these things. And I think that's a very important shift of balance, um, considering what a sort of perilous situation we are now in terms of um, climate change and the disastrous impact that that could have. And I, I am concerned because um, I, I mean, these are not particularly current cases, but I have a, a few cases have come to my notice where it does seem that the balance is still um, too much um, in favour of, um, you know, ab an absolute um, kind of protection of the appearance and structure of historic buildings where it seemed a more um, progressive interpretation should allow us to go a bit further. And I, I just wonder what um, uh, uh, Councillor Toomey Hawkins uh, w would say on that. Can, can, can we sort of, um, you know, encourage a, a sort of cultural shift towards um, a, a more progressive interpretation of the regulations? Thank you. You've excellently made points, uh, Councillor Hawkins. Um, I mean, we definitely want to be progressive, but we'd like to be progressive within within the guidelines that um, you know that government has set us. Uh, what we wouldn't want to do is find that uh, owners are interpreting legislation in a way that enables them to do work, which perhaps, you know, um, <laughs> should not be done without, you know, uh, proper uh, proper guidelines. So I would say um, we will make sure that, or we'll try and make sure that our guidelines are as clear as possible. But we would always obviously ask that building owners talk to us before they start to think about what they want to do. And I'm sure there are ways in which we will be able to, um, you know, um, discuss with them and advise them on how they can um, do this in a way that is, as you say, um, progressive. Thank you. Thank you. But I, mean, I, I would always encourage you to please, uh, you know, those of you who have that expertise and experience, please come and talk to me. Uh, come and talk to our officers. We are always willing to listen and to incorporate new knowledge um, into the guidance that we give to our residents. Thank you. Uh, I, I think there are there is some uh, work to be done um, as part of the Oxford Cambridge Arc on this as well, which hopefully, hopefully I can feed into and then that can feed into our own climate and environment committee. Uh, so I think we need to be possibly looking at the committee, Councillor Harvey, to be giving sort of more of a steer and some good case studies yeah. and some good examples, actually. So I agree, you know, we can do we can do more. We can do more on this. Um, so thank you very much for raising that. Um, so uh, Councillor Daunton would like to come um, back with another question. Yes, not to labour this point, just to come back very quickly, just to um, ask for some reassurance that our officers are um, maintaining close contact with Historic England. Um, on their latest thinking on this? Uh, definitely, <laughs> definitely. I mean, a, a lot of what we do, we need to make sure that we are in, we are in close contact with author, you know, the other authorities who, um, organisations um, who, you know, that are relevant to the work that we do. Okay, right. So in the absence of any more questions, um, so the recommendation is set out in paragraph four of the report and it says, uh, Peter, Oh, I'm uh, sorry, I'm, 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 Thank you, <laughs> sorry I'm, I'm summing up for you. So sorry, so keen to get on. Uh, Councillor Van der Waal, and then I'll come back to Councillor yeah, Hawkins. Just, just very, very briefly, I think this, this discussion has, has demonstrated the usefulness of the report in making us think about about what we're doing and feeding into the local plan. And so just to thank um, uh, officers for all of the effort to put all of this detail together into, into uh, um, uh, 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 this report, which is clearly an awful lot of work and, um, uh, and it, is, it is extremely useful and, and appreciated. Thank, thank you very much indeed. Now my thanks to members for raising important issues as well. Uh, Councillor Hawkins, do you want to sum summarise? Uh, no, just to thank everyone who's actually, you know, done some reading and, um, you know, asked questions, uh, certainly jogs the grey cells, as Poirot would say. Um, and um, to say that, as I said before, please, uh, ideas are all obviously always welcome. Um, doors are open to listen and to talk and to chat because at the end of the day, we are serving our residents. So um, if I can um, ask members to have a look at the recommendations on page 15, 
um, for A and B. Thank you very much, Leader. Thank you. So just to reiterate, uh, Cabinet's recommended to A, agree the Cambridge City and Council and South Cambridge and District Council Authority monitoring report for Greater Cambridge 2019 to 20, included as Appendix 1 for publication on the Council's website, and B, delegate any further minor editing changes to the Cambridge City Council and South Cambridge and District Council AMR for Greater Cambridge 2019-2020 to the Joint Director for Greater Cambridge Chaired Planning. Do members agree with the proposal? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, does anyone wish to vote against the proposal? And does anyone wish to abstain? Okay, so Cabinet therefore agrees the proposal by affirmation. And moving on to the last agenda item, which is the update on the health and wellbeing strategy. Uh, and Councillor Bill Handley is going to introduce this, and um, I, I'm very happy to uh, second it. So, Councillor Handley. Thank you, Leader. Um, the original health and wellbeing strategy uh, was uh, agreed by Cabinet back in June 2020. It was actually written mostly before the coronavirus pandemic effects were, were seen. Um, this paper gives an update uh, and details the progress of activities to date. Um, progress was inevitable, I think, that uh, progress was slowed by the pandemic. And given the circumstances, um, I, I think you'll agree that it's commendable that officers have actually done as much, made as much progress as they have. Um, and then there are the more red boxes uh, in the table. And I, I really like to thank officers and congratulate them on perseverance and um, uh, and dedication to to this to this work. So it's a snapshot. It's where we are. Uh, it's a work in progress. We will issue another date uh, update in later in the year, which will no doubt include more on the COVID response. Um, but uh, the the um, recommendation is that cabinet are asked to note the contents of the report and consider the impacts of COVID. Um, uh, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, so uh, does anyone from Cabinet wish to ask any questions about this? No. So I have a question in the box from Councillor Sue Ellington, who I know has a long standing interest in this. Thank you very much. Um, and a Happy New Year to all I haven't spoken to this year so far. Um, I really would like to congratulate the officers on the um, COVID community groups and the patchwork that they have done. They really have been excellent and I'm sure the, the residents are very grateful for that. And obviously the um, mobile wooden scheme, which is I'm just set, uh, involved in setting up in my patch is, is great. But there's one area where I, I happen to have been um, uh, receiving uh, exercise uh, from the referral scheme um, when the pandemic uh, started. And I do feel I had one session via um, Zoom and that was quite a successful, but then everything died. Um, and those people who had really been benefiting from yeah, having some morning. mobility training were um, uh, suddenly find they didn't have it anymore. I do feel some further efforts to put stuff online like mobility uh, exercises would be beneficial. Um, uh, and I have a personal trainer and, and I do all mine online and it's great. So can we think about that, please? Uh, thank, thank you very much indeed, Councillor Ellington. Yes, I do um, two online Pilates classes to uh, keep me moving when I spend most of the rest of the time sat in, in, front, in front of a screen. Um, and thank you for your, um, your kind words about the patchwork and for, uh, which may be going on. And thank you also for your, uh, your assistance in getting the mobile warden scheme up and running on your patch, which is something mm -hmm. we're we both of us um, think is marvellous. Uh, so, Councillor Handley, do you want to um, comment on um, the, the, the lack of 
the transition of the GP referral scheme into remote um, delivery? Um, it's something that I think I will take away. Um, I know that Lesley McFarlane, the officer responsible, is on is on the call, so no doubt she's scribbling away notes uh, as we speak. Uh, and I'll talk to you offline as well, Councillor Ellington. Okay. Do, does some um, would Leslie like to add anything there? Because actually, I'm sure this is something she's looked into. Yes. Um, attempts were made originally to provide uh, kind of Zoom type classes. Um, my understanding was that because of the demographic um, that they, they weren't proving popular and they didn't have enough uptake. So that's why they were, you know, for all intents and purposes, shelved. Um, but I can certainly go back to them with your comments, Sue, and, um, uh, and get some feedback, which I can get back to you. Thank you. So I think we I think we I think we might find, Leslie, that, you know, people who weren't kind of online at the beginning of this pandemic have been bought um, iPads and things by their families uh, in order to keep in contact with them. So it might be, you know, the situation might have changed now, actually. So I think this absolutely is worth is worth looking at, um, particularly as, you know, the gyms have all had to close and some of them are, uh, uh, including my own, are, you know, potentially not can't be made COVID compliant, even when the restrictions uh, start start lifting. So, uh, so yeah, I would appreciate that being looked at again because, as I say, I think things I think things probably have changed there. Um, thank you. Is that is that anything else, Councillor Ellington? No, thank you very much. Super, thank you, um, Councillor De Lacey. Thank you very much, Leader. Uh, and I'd like to add my thanks to Leslie and her team for all that they've done. It's a tremendous amount of work. Um, and particularly page 258 of the agenda, it's great to see a large number of successes that we have uh, been able to chalk up. Uh, but perhaps thinking about improvement, it's sometimes helpful to look at one's failures as well. And I wonder, without any criticism that uh, these failures have happened, whether Leslie or the uh, or Councillor Handley would be able to comment on areas where, for various reasons, we haven't done what we were hoping to do. I've seen the red red lines, obviously, in the table. Uh, that's not quite what I'm thinking of, but um, uh, failures that might uh, it, it instruct us going uh, forward. And the second question, if I may, on uh, the next page, page 259, under 23, food vouchers, um, I'd be interested to know uh, how that scheme has worked. I'm not quite sure what the last line of that opening the high street officers means. I presume it's possibly a typo uh, and whether we've actually provided food parcels as well, in which case I hope they have been well above government standard. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's it's not it's not a typo, actually. Um, no. Councillor Handley, do you want to take that or do you want, do you want to defer no, to I Leslie? I, I think actually Leslie would be better placed to, to, to comment on this. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, just had to find the microphone in the video there. Um, in terms of um, what we've not been able to achieve, I think um, part of that is uh, our very much have we been focused on uh, the, the kind of front line supporting the volunteer groups. So a lot of the business as usual um, has been postponed um, until we're through the worst of it. So I think we had that lull in September where things started to return to some normality, um, but then October hit. Um, and again, we're very much focused on, on sort of supporting our volunteer groups and delivering sort of frontline support to residents. Um, in terms of the food vouchers, so this was something that came out of the um, county uh, COVID hub, support hub, um, looking at how we can address some of the inequalities that we're seeing, which have been exposed as a result of COVID. Uh, and one of those was just helping younger families um, access um, uh, sort of uh, cheap and, and healthy food. Um, we know that a lot of the larger supermarkets um, accept food vouchers, but if you're a young parent and you're living in a rural village and you may not have access or you cannot afford a bus or a taxi, um, then how do you access um, these, uh, sort of cheap sources of food? So 
we decided that we'd harness the um, those opportunities of working with the high street officers. We knew that they were going into every store um, across the district. So it was about having a conversation with those stores um, to offer uh, these vouchers to young families and then working with the uh, younger children's centres through county, uh, ensuring that mo young mothers knew about them so that we had a kind of two pronged approach um, to ensuring that uptake was maximised as much as possible. Unfortunately, um, due to COVID or oh, through COVID, our third lockdown, we're not getting the food parcels uh, that the government were providing in the initial lockdown. But what we are doing is we're working very closely again with the hub and we are ensuring that any parent that comes through to us that is in need of food, um, we are providing them with the food bank vouchers which has now been extended to as an ongoing um, source of uh, provision rather than uh, it was originally a three week source. You know, you could have three lots of food bank vouchers and then that was it. Now it's, you know, um, in, you know until the, the pandemic is, is through the worst. Thank, thank you, Leslie. Do, the, do those vouchers also allow people to um, get things like nappies and uh, toiletries and so on? Yes. Yeah, so what happens is uh, you you would apply for you would name how or, or, or state how many people in your household and the ages, and you can state that you need nappies, milk, um, and s specific provisions for the ages of your children, and and that they will also then determine how much to provide in, in a food parcel. So if you've got four sort of a sixteen and a fourteen year old and two adults you'd get a much different food parcel to if you've got two young children and a single parent. Charlie good. So I have every confidence that this um, sort of service being delivered locally means that it will be of high quality, uh, unlike some of the centrally um, allocated schemes. So thank you very much. Is that, yeah. um, is, does that answer your question, Councillor Delacy? I'm enormously encouraged by that. Thank you very much indeed. The, the only comment I'd make is I hope we're encouraging parents to think about terribly nappies rather than just disposables uh, if we have any influence on them in, in how they're bringing up their families. But thank you very much, Leah. Thank, thank you very much indeed. Um, so I've now got uh, Councillor Claire Daunton. Um, thank you, Leader. I've got um, three questions, so I'll be very quick. Um, the first question is page 265, um, one of the um, items in amber there, and it takes me back to my earlier point on the planning audit report, um, and it's sharing e expertise on um, healthy living and independent living. Um, and it's on, I just wondered why um, it's still amber, it's still to be delivered. That's my first question. Okay, Leslie, would you like to respond to that? Sorry, I'm just looking up 265. I suggest you leave your leave your camera and your microphone on. You're going to be needed. So you've got quite a few questions coming yeah, up. Yeah, just a second. So uh, it, this is a health impact assessment. Um, um, it's uh, the creation of the top 10 tips to future proof your home. Again, I am. Uh, I'm just waiting to hear back from planning as to the best person to liaise with on that project. So it's really, um, just, yeah, then I can then I can take it forwards. So that, that's something that's very easily resolved. OK, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Leader. Might I go on to my next two Please, questions? Yep. Uh, so I'm back to page 258. Um, and really just sort of reiterating what other people have said. Um, thanks to Leslie for all the work on the mobile warden scheme, um, which is, is already making a difference in this world. And also to acknowledge the work of Councillor John Williams on that as well. Very important in terms of the funding. Um, and then on the volunteers, um, what's come out of uh, the COVID council members and officers response to the COVID crisis is how fantastic our volunteers are and particularly the coordinators and whether there is any plans to sort of harness that for the future, particularly the expertise, the growing expertise of the coordinators. Can I answer the last, the second please. point, uh, Leader, first? Yes, please do. Actually, we, were, we, we were looking at ways of harnessing the um, the, the 
the COVID, uh, COVID volunteer response all last summer. But of course, events overtook us. The, you know, the depth of the pandemic was such that we, we thought we had to leave it. But certainly it is uh, something that we will uh, attempt, we, we, we will look to, to do um, as soon as we think it's the right, the right time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Leslie, is there anything you want to add to any of that? Uh, a, yes, this was a point that was actually raised at le uh, to a leadership team back in, in December when we took this report to them. And we have a briefing paper going to a leadership team tomorrow. Um, just as a, you know, we, we recognise this as an opportunity to harness that energy and enthusiasm that's coming out of the community groups but on, on an ongoing basis so what we don't want to do is to see this dissipate um, this is a real opportunity for us to work with community groups to encourage health and well-being right at the grassroots level yeah. it's through walking groups um, as an example um, but actually broadening it so working with community groups perhaps um, on a kind of self they self-select what issues are important to them and we support them. So it could be through green issues, it could be emergency planning or it could be health and well-being. So this is something, as I say, that we're going to take to leadership team tomorrow to discuss further and no doubt it will be coming back to Cabinet fairly soon. Excellent. Good, good, good. And I hope when we're, when we're all allowed to get together, uh, we, can, we can do something lovely for all those leaders in all the communities, perhaps uh, Yes, perhaps have a have a jolly, which would be nice. Uh, yeah, you had a third question. On that. Sorry, yeah. just to, just to comment on that. I think it's also really important for ward members as well. It's been very helpful for us to have the um, input into the COVID volunteer groups. So thank you. Did you have another question, Councillor Daunton? No, that's my three. Thank you, Leader. You're, I'm finished. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Councillor Anna Bradnam. Thank you, Leader. Um, my question is uh, page 267 and I suspect this might might perhaps end up being again directed to L Linda McFarlane, but um, it's relating to this creation of a mental health officer post and uh, certainly in my own village um, being on the COVID support group we have encountered this that we find that there are some individuals who have um, required the expertise and cleverness of our support network to understand how best to handle individual people who have very specific mental needs and we I absolutely understand how much time that can take up and I just wondered what other solutions uh, are being considered and whether um, there is any cross council working with the county council or if it's only through the um, Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Foundation Trust or whether there's any support that's available through the County Council that could be harnessed to help on this. So my, so my understanding is that uh, that that post and I, I stand to be corrected was to have somebody in the house who could work as part of our multidisciplinary teams. Um, I also am aware that we are offering mental health training uh, to officers and the community groups, which has had a poor uptake, uptake. And I think we're doing a, we've been doing a further push uh, in the last week or so. So I think I think there's lots on offer. Um, Councillor Handley, do you want to add anything to that? And then I'll come to um, to um, Leslie. Um, only only as much as you know, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that uh, you know officers have been working very very hard on the COVID response, and um, there are some things that and inevitably have um, have had to go by the wayside. And I th unfortunately, this is one of them. I mean, they've been redeployed. Officers have been redeployed. Uh, from business as usual uh, to the COVID response. So um, I think the answer that's given in the red box is adequate, actually. Yeah. Uh, Les Leslie, do you want to add anything? Yeah, just it, it's, it's been a source of frustration for us. We we were getting we progressed really well up until August of last year in uh, working with CPFT to second a member of their staff. But then, of course, when um, you know, they, they have difficulties with their own staffing um, and they're also working flat out in the NHS at the moment. Um, we had discussed um, recruiting somebody who was a private um, mental health worker and not connected to CPFT. But one of the reasons why we wanted to work with CPFT is because there would be an open door if we needed to um, refer uh, to, you know, for more support. 
Um, and we think that if we go down that private um, worker route um, or private professional route, we will still be working against a closed door. And that's one of the frustrations of working with CPFT and the NHS is when you're trying to get that additional support. Um, it's very, very difficult to get hold of. I'm encouraged that we've got, now we've got the vaccination programme underway. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. And I think that this would be a good, I think spring would be a really good opportunity to take up those conversations again with CPFG. They were very keen at the time. They could really see the value of having someone working in housing. Um, so I, I don't think that it's not that they're interested, they're just working flat out. So I think, that, yeah, I think that I think this, the, the best option still is to go with CPFT if we can. Yeah, uh, I, I completely, I completely agree. So. I think that's a very sound um, yeah, decision. Yeah. <laughs> OK, thank and you. Um, thank you very much indeed, Councillor Bradman. Um, Councillor Hazel Smith. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. A leader. Um, I, I also was going to raise the mental health officer because I'm, I'm very keen that uh, that we should get somebody in um, to work with housing. Um, certainly um, going to be quite quite um, useful to us. Um, the, the other thing uh, which I picked up was um, on page 266 air quality monitoring. I just wondered where we got to now with with buying and positioning monitors and um, just not to forget about the other things which are in here, um, important as the COVID response is and, and working with people because, um, you know, traffic is building up again. Um, also, um, I wanted to ask about the recommendation, um, which um, in in paragraph 10, it talks about the the this review is a six month review. I think we should probably be looking at reviewing again as we're coming out of COVID and whether we make that six months from now or um, leave, leave it open. Um, I, I suspect um, a, t um, a time scale would be useful, but um, I'll take people's views on that. But, um, you know, six or nine months or something. Thank, thank you. So if I take if I take your second point first, my gut feeling is um, kind of straight straight after the summer is possibly uh, possibly the right time. But I'm interested to know what um, Councillor Handley and uh, and Leslie feel about that. Um, I'm going to ask Brian if he's got any update on the air quality monitoring. Failing that, we'll come to uh, come to Trevor because we used to talk about this a lot and we talk about COVID now. Yeah, so we've, we've certainly got um, new air quality monitors uh, dotted around the um, uh, district. Uh, there's not, not too many of them. Uh, Trevor might give some more accurate uh, quantitative um, data, and I haven't seen any up-to-date data from uh, those monitors. So, um, But it's, um, it's in the monitoring uh, report as well as the um, uh, uh, this health and well well-being report. Uh, so we're we're clearly, you know, very active in this space, and we we want to make sure that um, actually, you know, the A14 was an example, wasn't it, where um, uh, the contractors really aren't, weren't weren't taking any um, uh, active measures, and we um, persuaded them to do so. Yes, yes, there was some tremendous action from the local members there. Um, so on the uh, to Councillor Handley, um, as far as the sort of when when this is reviewed, we obviously need a plan that is a a, um, a health and well-being COVID recovery plan, really, because there's going to be, you know, we're going to have people in our communities still suffering from long COVID even after everybody's been vaccinated. I think the mental health problems are going to be, you know, seriously ongoing. The anxiety levels that everybody is experiencing, and then, you know, there's things like a rise in um, serious rise in eating disorders and so on. So, uh, and and bereavement support, and you know, there's going to be there's going to be a, a heck of a lot of long-term health and well-being consequences, even once the virus has stopped. Um, running running rampant around around the world so i just wonder what your views are on the best timing to do this i, I agree entirely and and something that we have been we have been talking about as to the i i suspect that uh from the spring we might be in a much better position to know um you know how we can roll this forward 
and that that would be my that would be my plan. And I'll be talking with uh, Leslie and Gareth and others uh, to see how we push it push it on. Okay, so you're, so you'd rather we didn't commit to a time frame now. We we let that um, I think, evo I think, evolve with rest I with think, you. I think under the circumstances at the moment, we are still very much engaged in uh, the, the COVID uh, pandemic response. I think it, uh, a week might be a long time actually uh, in this. So um, ca can we leave this one uh, on ice just for the moment? Um, probably come back to you in a week or two with a, with a firmer set of proposals. That, that's fine. There's, there's no hurry on this. As I say, you know, things change daily. Leslie, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, uh, I'll, I'll go with Bill and we'll liaise and, and figure out a good time. That's, that's lovely. OK, uh, and then I've got um, a, a briefly speak uh, from Councillor Bradnam. Sorry, I just wanted to apologise for accidentally calling Leslie Linda earlier on. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no problem, I'm sure. So. OK, so if there are no more questions, uh, Cabinet's recommended to note the contents of uh, the report. Um, I say I was meant to, I'm seconding it, aren't I? I just wanted to say that um, I, I think it's absolutely phenomenal that we've actually stayed on track with so much of this. I would not have been at all surprised if 80 percent of this plan had been flagged red, quite honestly, with all the pressures we've, we've been put under. So, you know, huge congratulations to Leslie and all her team uh, you know that they've they've managed to keep the show on the road really, and that they've produced a a plan that has been able to flex to deal with the terrible situation we're in at the moment so very very effectively. Um, so I you know I think you've done brilliantly, uh, and um, yes, and long long may long may it continue. So my thanks to you all. I'm sure you're all absolutely exhausted, uh, but I know um, myself and my own residents are extremely grateful for everything that you've achieved and the fact that you've really kept business as usual, as well as, you know, the, all the awful stuff has, that's been uh, laid at our door as well online is marvellous. Um, so, um, Councillor Handley, is there anything else you want to say in summing up? Um, no, I think you've put, the, 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 what I was going to sum up was, was the thanks and you've done it eloquently. Uh, I just say I 100% support everything you've just said. Thank you very much indeed. So Cabinet's recommended to note the contents of the report and consider the impacts of COVID on the delivery of activities and services which promote physical and mental health and well-being. So do members agree with the proposal? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Does, it, does, anybody, does anyone wish to vote against? I, I note that Councillor Peter MacDonald has had to leave the meeting, by the way, at 10.51 to attend a health appointment, which is appropriate. I hope he's fine. Um, anybody wish to vote against? And anybody wish to abstain? No. OK, so Cabinet therefore agrees the proposals by affirmation. So that takes us to the end in just over an hour. Um, the next meeting of Cabinet scheduled to take place on Wednesday, the 3rd of February 2021 at 10 o'clock. And uh, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Uh, please, can we end the live stream?